the culture of worship. Praise God. Praise God. Please come quickly go to Ezekiel chapter 36 from verse 26 to 37. Ezekiel 36 from verse 26 to 27. Quickly, projection, are you with me? Okay. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, before you go to the next verse, um, when it comes to the context of worship, one of the first things and very urgent that needs to be fixed is our heart. Praise God. Praise God. Because you see, it takes a tender heart to truly worship God. Because worship involves the tenderness of your heart. It involves humility. It involves submission. Complete submission. One of the most difficult things for humans to do is to submit. If we look at this verse, God has looked at his people and he has figured out something that's wrong. And he knew that what was wrong that needed to be fixed was their what? Was their what? Was their heart. And so he said that I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone. So which means that there is such a thing as the heart of stone. Do you understand? Do you understand? When a person's heart is not tender towards him, of course you know that that person's heart cannot be tender. You, you cannot claim to love God if you don't love people. I hope you understand. So when I talk about someone's, someone whose heart is not tender towards God, invariably and interchangeably, you can say the person is not tender towards man. Truly. Praise God. And they may, they may deceive themselves and they may act, but truly, it's not. But you see, he said that I will take away that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This verse. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my commandments and do them. Which means that a person who has the heart of stone, it's not possible for you to keep his commandments. It's not possible for you to walk in his statutes. It's not possible for you to please him. It's completely impossible. Because from where your worship is supposed to originate from, it's faulty. Your, the, the foundation, the roots is faulty. And so it's definitely going to manifest or show in other areas. Because the foundation is faulty. Scripture says that guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow what? The issues of life. So everything that happens to a man first originates from the heart of the man. Even the words that you say, scripture says that out of the abundance of the heart, the man will do what? The man will speak. That's why you can find yourself saying things. That, I mean, if you have ever gotten angry before, so angry, you said something and then you now say that, um, I know I said some things I did not mean. I'm sorry, but you meant it. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> Let me tell you this. You can have a heart condition that is different from your mind condition. Do you understand? You can have a heart condition that is different from your mind condition, which means that in your mind, you, you, you know this is not the right thing to do. But your heart, at some point in time, is going to override your mind. Ah, please, ask David. Let David tell you. Ask David, let him tell you. That's why David will pray and say, Lord, there are two prayers that I find very interesting that David prayed in the Bible. Number one, he said, Lord, search my heart and see if there be any iniquity in me. Which means that by himself, there is a kind of search that he could not do. Let me tell you this. It's possible for you to evaluate yourself wrongly. You can have a problem in your heart and not know it. So you think you are okay. 
but you are not. And then another prayer David would pray is, Lord, give me a pure heart. He said, create in me a clean heart. David committed sin of adultery with Bathsheba. His heart was faulty, but he did not know. It took prophet Nathan to come to him and to speak to him in parable before he realized what he did. So I said to you, what you said in anger was in your heart. You meant it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? You had a problem with your spouse, and then you were angry, and then you said many things. And they said, wow, I can't believe you spoke to me like this. No, I, it wasn't intentional. I really didn't mean it. No, sir, you meant it. There is a problem with your heart. You need to fix it. And that's why he said that I will give you the heart of flesh and take away the heart of stone. It, it's a surgery that does not necessarily mean cutting you off. And by the way, I hope you know I'm not referring to this heart that pumps blood. And the same Bible will say that the heart of man is what? Talk to me now. The heart of man is what? You can have a faulty heart and not know. That's what I'm saying. And not know. So one of the prayers you should pray, like David, is Lord, create in me a clean heart. Because sooner or later, the content of your heart is going to spill into either your words or your actions or both. So a person who has a faulty heart, whether now or later, you are going to displease God in a big way. In a very big way. So it's important for us to have, have a clean heart. We're going to continue with the culture of worship. Of course, this is the foundation. Last week, we talked about the culture of worship as the general topic. But today, um, maybe we will talk, God help us, we, we will talk a bit about the act and the art of worship. A-C-T and A-R-T of worship. So there is the act of worship and then there is the art of worship. Are you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand? So there is the act of worship, which is the actual, the actual action of worship, and then there is the art of worship, which is the mode of worship. Are you getting what I'm saying? And so we'll look at a few scriptures, because to be quite frank, like I said um, last week when we started this teaching, for those of you that were not here, we said that worship is not a mood. You know how sometimes worship leaders will come and say, let's be in the mood of worship. And so usually when I hear that, the first thing I ask myself is, so what mood were you in before? Were you in the mood of murder or in the mood of fornication? What mood were you in before? The first thing that we offer in worship is our lives. Praise God. Praise God. See, before you bring your song, eh? before you bring your song, bring your life. And like I said, songs are like food, right? But your life is the plate in which you serve the food. So by the time you come to God, giving him beautiful, sweet-smelling food, but in a dirty plate, how do you expect him to eat it? And so we said that the foundation of worship is a clean life. Praise God. And so if you look at Romans chapter 12, where he talked about presenting your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which means that it can be unacceptable unto God. Amen. Praise God. Please ask your neighbor, is, is this your body right now acceptable unto God? You know, I know you have come. You have come to church. You have come into his presence. So, so it's not me now. It's the Bible. Don't look at me like that. He said that you should come. He said present your bodies, which means that as you come, what do you present? Oh. What do you present? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, which means I take God, beg you. He says that you present your bodies. So by the time you come to church, what have you done? Yes, that's what you did first. Walking through the doors, 
you presented your body. So he said that you present your body as a living sacrifice, number one, comma, which means that what is going to say afterwards is an added quality to what is required. Yes or no? So he said you should bring, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, number one. Number two, your body must be what? You know, people say that holiness is for hearts. Yeah, it's not by, don't judge a book by its cover. It's a lie. What is in your heart will eventually show what's outside. Hello? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes, what we're seeing now is a reflection of what is inside. Let's not deceive ourselves. So he said that you should present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Because you can, you can bring your, not everybody who comes to church is accepted by God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes, not everybody who presents their body. So he said that it has to be acceptable to God. So the fact that you came does not mean you're accepted. Does your body, make, does your body meet these requirements? There's a version that said, which is your reasonable worship? So first of all, your worship is your body. I want us to take a little peep into heaven and, and see what God looks like. You see, the Bible is not sufficient hmm, to compare the attributes of God with the experience that you would have when you meet him and all that he truly represents or his essence. So there are many things about God that we are still going to discover when we meet him. Do you understand? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? But you see, there was an account in the Bible that gave us a, a little bit of information about this God. Now, I'm talking about the God that you came here to worship. The one that when we say let's pray, you choose to be unperturbed. You are too sophisticated to bow in worship. You are too you are too neat and clean to mess up your makeup. So, so I, I want us to look at this God. Revelation chapter 4, quickly. From verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, from, from verse 1. Now, there is an apostle called Apostle John. This apostle, eh? <laughs> let me tell you a bit about him. Apostle John was one who bragged about himself being the closest to Jesus amongst the other disciples. Are you getting what I'm saying? So he would, he would often refer to himself as the disciples who Jesus loved. He, he called himself John the Beloved. I don't know if you understand. He was the one who rested his, his head on Jesus' chest when they were relaxing. He, he was that one that was, that if, if, if Jesus had them as children, you would say that this one is the, is the favorite. So, so, so now, this Apostle John, as close as he was with Jesus, he, he was so close to Jesus that, you remember that Jesus told um, 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 Philip, have you seen me yet? You don't know the Father. Ah, but you, they don't know him. They did not have a glimpse about the Father. What, what they saw was the dimension of the Father in terms of his relationship with us. Do you understand? Because before the New Testament, he was seen as God, not necessarily Father. But in the New Testament, Jesus came to introduce God to us as Father. Are you getting me? And so, what happened here was an account of um, um, an exposure. Apostle, Bo uh, Apostle John was exposed. He was given a glimpse of this God that he knew or he thought he knew. And so he says, after these things, I looked, this is John speaking, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. Hello. First of all, he said that, after the things I looked, I hope you know that he wasn't talking about physical sight here. He was talking about a revelation. He was describing a revelation, a vision that he had. Are you following me? Oh, you are not here. Are you here? I need you to be here. Praise God. Are you here? Okay. So, he said, and the first voice, no, no, first of all, he said, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me was like a trumpet. Trumpets don't speak. But when you get to another realm, you can hear voices like, anyway. He says, come up here. And I will do what? And I will show you things which must take place after this, which means that I want to give you a little expo 
of what happens after this life. He says that I will show you things which must take place. It's not which may, which must take place after this. Next verse. Immediately I was in where? In the spirit. You cannot behold him in the flesh. You can't. You cannot. You see, there the, the are certain... There are certain things, eh? When God created the world, there are certain things that he created your flesh to withstand. Some things in the spirit can only be seen from the spirit. If you, if you see it in the physical, you may not be able to stand. This, what, he had to see it in the spirit, which means that he wasn't, he, there's no way some of these things you can, you can see it in the physical. You have to be in the spirit to see it. And then he said that, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one, capital letter O, is not anyone. He said one with the capital letter O sat on the throne. Next verse. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. Now picture it. There was a throne. He says that he who sat on the throne was like a jasper and a sardius stone. These are uncommon precious stones. He said, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. I wish there was somebody who was into jewelries and precious stones to, to, to give us samples of these beautiful stones. These are very expensive stones. But I hope you know that we are not talking about them in, in bits. We are, we are talking, it's describing the beauty. You are seeing the precious stones in, in bodily form. And it says that there was a rainbow around. When we were children at the time, after a serious rain, next you see rainbow, everybody say, see rainbow, see rainbow, see rainbow. It, 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 but, but he said that there was rainbow around the throne. Colors. The, the throne is, when we sing that you are beautiful beyond description, honestly speaking, God cannot be effectively described. If you have not seen him, you cannot, you cannot accurately describe him. You can only describe a part of him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so, next verse. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Now, follow closely. They said, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. Listen. Do you know what it means for heaven to call a person an elder? Don't, don't forget. You see, I, please try, try, try and stay with me. Don't forget that we are describing something that is out of time. We are describing something that happens in eternity. Eternity is, is time, time is of no, they don't think in time over there. Do you understand? Time, I wish I, wish I can explain this. They don't think in time. You know now you can say, okay, I'll be here, I'll be by this time. No, time does not exist in that realm. So if time does not exist, it means that people in that place, they don't have age. Do you understand? And Jabir Gabriel cannot come and tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm 440 years old. No, he does not have an age because time does not exist in this realm that he was created. How much more God? And so when heaven calls a person an elder, it means that their work with God is, is, is not elder because of age. That's what I'm driving at. It's an elder because of status in their work with God. They were kings. Kings appointed by God who once lived on the earth. And it says that I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, which means that they have gone through this life, they have been tested, they, they have been given their reward. They had crowns of gold on their head. They were certified by heaven as kings. Now you don't understand. These, these are men of caliber. They are not, they are not your, your regular politicians. They are not politicians. They are people who have weight. Wait in heaven. And it says that there are crowns, there were crowns of gold on their head. Next verse. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. From that throne, it didn't say God was speaking. It said just sitting. Eh? Things are happening. There are activities around the throne. Huh. It, it said that there, there, there are lightnings. There are thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. <laughs> Heaven 
heaven is not bright because they have lantern. Do you understand? See, see, the light in heaven is not, is not PSN generated. It's not, it's not produced by generator. He said that there were seven lamps of fire that were burning. Those lamps were the, they are the seven spirits of God. One day we'll talk about them, all right? Next verse. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. A sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. I tell people, let me tell you, when we get to heaven, of course, you will not be in this particular flesh, but there are creatures that you will be shocked. You will think that they should be in hell. Weird creatures. The Bible talks about um, um, a wheel of eyes. There is... There's a, there's, a, there's a creature in heaven that, that is a wheel of eyes, which means, imagine wheel of eyes. There's a creature that has the face of a lion, the face of a lamb, the face of man. You see, all sorts of creatures. But they have, they have, um, they have destiny, they have purpose. You will see what they are doing. It says, and the four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Next verse. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. It says that the first living creature was like a lion. You know, do you know what lion represents? Huh? Huh? Talk now. Strength, dominion, authority. You understand? Authority. It, 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 it represents kingship. You understand? You know, the, the lion is not necessarily by mass. It's not the biggest animal in the, in the, in the jungle. But, but he is the king of the jungle. There's a reason. If you study lions, lions don't even go to hunt. It's the, it's the lionesses that go to, to hunt. They, they, they chill. The second living creature, like a calf. Remember the lamb of God that was slain? Represents meekness. Which means he can be a lion and also be as gentle and calm as a calf. What God is to you is not what he is to your enemies. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? See, what he is to you is not what he is to, to your enemies. He says, and the third living creature, like the face of a man who can relate with your, he said, we do not have the high priest that, are, that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Do you understand? So, so he can relate with you more than you think. And then he said, the fourth living creature, like a flying eagle. Like a flying eagle. What does eagle represent? To me now. Remember the scripture says that they that wait upon the Lord shall win their strength and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Eagles represent strength. The ego, when recently I watched a documentary about, you know, on the ego, the, the animals that the ego pick from the earth, you'll be shocked. It's like I saw an ego picking goat with his um he, he picked the goat and took the goat to the mountain. When the eagle gets to a certain age, it goes to the mountain and it removes the feathers and allows another one to grow. The eagle is a powerful creature. But let's leave that. Next verse. It says that the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. What are they saying? These creatures are outside time. Oh. Do you understand? Which means that for, for aeons, for years, 
we cannot count for infinity. The only thing that they are doing is what? They cry every day, every night. They are shouting, Holy, Holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They are proclaiming that, these creatures oh, in, in heaven. See, if you can picture what I just described, you will realize that, to be quite frank, to be very honest with you, if you walked into church and you saw the throne of heaven here, your knees cannot carry your body. You see, this your legs. You cannot carry your body. The only reason why we have a problem worshipping God is simply because we do not have a revelation of who he is. The minute you come to understand who God is, your worship changes. Completely. Because you drove a good car and you come to a congregation and it looks as if you are maybe the richest or the mo most exposed or something, then you cannot kneel before God. You are a joker. You don't know God. You don't know God. Because you have some millions or maybe you have PhD or you are something, you, you cannot lift your hands in worship. They say, let's worship you. You are doing something else. You, you find worship as a... It says that these creatures in, in, the, in the... Even one of these creatures, if you see it, you, you may pass out. You may never recover. But, but, but they, they look at him. They, 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 they are singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Next verse. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. See what happens. Next verse. The 24 elders, what do they do? Hey, you are saying it as if, as if you are guilty of something that I have not said. When those creatures, when they make those declarations, don't, don't forget that they, they keep saying it. They keep saying it. Don't forget that they, they keep saying it. They keep saying it. They keep saying it. But the Bible is saying that for each time they say it, what happens? The 24 elders, they do what? They, they didn't say they bow. Please read it where the way he said it. He said that they fall down before him. I, I told you about those elders, but they're not children. They're not small children. They're people that you cannot even, you, you, they're not your mates. He says that they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying what? Next verse. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So each time those creatures, they, 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 they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Who was, who is, and who is to come. The 24 elders will cast their crowns. Before they, they fall on the ground and cast their crowns. And then they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. Or not. My question to you, when was the last time you casted your crown before him? Do you know what a crown represents? To you, there are several crowns that you have, your achievements. Oh, I'm a fine girl. I, when I worship, I'm going to mess, mess up my steeds. Ah, I, I, I don't want to look too, too holy or too, too churchy. Worship becomes unclassy. So, so we look at people who, who, who do these things, who bow, who worship. We look at them as you know, people, people cry before him. You see, if you, if you ever, ever have a glimpse of half, no, 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 one third or one tenth of everything I just described, you can't stand. You can't stand. You would fall down and worship him. Let me tell you how bad it is. Should I tell you how bad it is? In the Bible, when Jesus, remember when um, the storm, the sea, you know, and when he moved to the other side, there was this madman of Gadarenes. How many of you remember that story? The madman that was possessed with the legion of demons, right? What happened when that man saw Jesus? 
What's the first thing he did? Eh? Scripture says that he fell down. Please, projection, look for that scripture for me. He, he fell down and worshipped him. Demons. 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 The one that we cast out. They fall down, they worship him. But you, 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 ah, you are rock. You like, no, that guy knows how to sing. Maybe the other one sing. Ah, you don't know God, oh, you are my dear. It says, You created all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. Ah. If only, is it, can, can you see why we read last week that the Bible says that God is in search, He's in need of those who worship Him in what? Don't, don't, don't forget that when we started this discussion, we said that Apostle John, he had this revelation in what? In the Spirit, right? And so, so, so God had this in mind. When he said that he is seeking for people who can worship him in spirit and truth, because he needs you to come to where he is, to see who he is, so that you can worship him the way you should worship him. If only we could see God in his majesty. You think people falling down, people receiving their healing is all there is to God? No. 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 God can, see, let me tell you a bit about God, please. I, I, I just feel very, God, eh? The Bible says that he sent his word, like he can sit and speak. The words will come out from his mouth and walk and go and do something. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, he's sitting on his throne. God does not run up and down. You know when you say, Jesus, you expect that Jesus is not panicking. Oh, what do you want? What do you want? No, 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 no. He's sitting on his throne. Scripture says that he, he sends his word and the word heals that disease. So when he releases the word from his mouth, the word comes out from his mouth in bodily form and starts to do things. Scripture says that through his words, where the, 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 the world, the, the word was framed by his words. When God spoke in the beginning, his words were not for communication. It was for creation. That's the one that we serve. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that's the God that we... Scripture says that he, he, his voice cracks the mountains. The reason why you cannot see God is for your protection. Not, not necessarily because he does not want to show you. If, if God shows you himself, you, you will die. You were not created to withstand that level of glory in this body. You were not. Your body will melt. It would, it would, it would dematerialize. So the next time you come and you hear, let's worship. Ha! Ah, please remember that we are not talking about. We are not talking about me. We are not talking about your president. We are talking about one who who has activities for eternity going on around his throne. Things are happening around this throne. I want to show you how specific um, worship was back in the day, right? Second Chronicles 5.11, please. And so when they would come to the temple and it was time to worship, the first time I read this scripture, I was wondering, ah, why give us these details? I felt that the details were quite unnecessary. But the Holy Spirit ministered to me and said that God does not waste words. He says, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the most holy place. This is describing when the ark was returned to, to, to Israel, right? When, it was, when they built the tent, you know, and the ark was in the tent. He says that... Um, the priest came out of the holy place for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping general divisions. So what, what he's saying here is that normally priests would take turns 
So the priest that functions today is not the priest that will function tomorrow, right? And so um, at that particular day, all the priests, they, be, what, this is what sanctified themselves here. Talks about the ritual that they would do. They would appease, you know, I've taught you about the um, structure of the old, um, the temple of the old covenant, right? The outer court, inner court, holy of holies, and all of that. So, so it says that they, they sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions, which means that all of them were on duty that day. You understand? So they, they left their roster, and all of them came to do their priestly work at the same time. Next verse. And the Levites who were the singers, listen to this, all those of As- Asaph and Eman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar. Number one, their physical posture, or rather position, was recorded. Are you following what I'm saying? Why, why do we have to know where they stood? Was it, is, it, is it important to you? He said that they, they, they stood at the east end of the altar. Then the next thing he said was what they wore. Now I'm telling you how worship is perceived from that realm. He said that they, they were clothed in white linen. I don't need to tell you that that signified purity, right? But, but it's showing you, this is why, in case if you're a chorister here, this is why people wear uniform. This is why choir members wear uniform. You understand? Even though sometimes some choirs, they don't sing. He said that they, clothed, they were clothed in white linen, having cymbals, telling us that they had instruments. Praise God. Praise God. Stringed instruments and harps, and with them, 120 priests sounding with trumpets. So, first of all, he tells us their physical position, where they stood. They didn't stand in just anywhere, they stood in the east side of the altar. It means something, but let's leave that. They stood in the east side of the so where they stood was a concern. It was important for them to stand at that particular place. Then he told us that they wore white linen. So their appearance before God, who was being represented by the Ark of the Covenant, was important. Don't tell me how you look. It's not important. It's important. If it was not important, it would not be in the Bible. Even when we stand before men, when we have certain, certain meetings and and. We look in a certain way. So you know, inside your heart, you know that the way you appear is actually important. And then it tells us that they had instruments of worship. They had aids. In this category, you will have songs. You have equipment. It said that 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Next verse. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were what? Were as one. Which means that they were united in every way for them to offer worship that would be recognized by heaven. Unity was a factor. Do you understand what I'm saying? Unity was a factor. Not that one person is singing and that person is not singing. Or one person is standing and that person is sitting. He said that the, the minute... He said, when the trumpeters and singers were as one. Now, if you, if you read this sentence carefully, you know that it, it was as though they walked into it. It was a process. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? He said, he said, when they were as one. To make what? To make what now? To make one sound. See, time will not permit us. One sound doesn't necessarily mean they're singing the same part. For those that are musically inclined, they understand. But you see, when it talks about one sound, it means that when, you see, God is not an Englishman. I hope you know. So when you sing English songs, it's not necessarily transcending to him as English. It's going to him as sound. Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so the, the sound that you're communicating will determine what you are actually saying to him. And that sound is not just generated by the lyrics of the words. The actions also are in sync with the sound. So when it comes to God, 
Even the way you stood is a sound. The way you bowed is a sound. So he said that when they produced one sound, what happened? That, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals, now, now, first of all, let me show you some, something. Do you realize that he talked about them making one sound before he talked about them lifting up their voice with trumpets and cymbals? So what was making the sound if it's not the trumpets and cymbals? Hey, you're not following he said that they were as one. You know, I just told you that it was not necessarily the song. They were singing the same parts of the song. No, that's not what the Bible is saying. But you see, the, their hearts, their spiritual posture, their attitude, everything became one sound. And he said that when they now lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy and just forever that the house, the house of the Lord was what? Was filled with a cloud. Now, this is not a, a figure of speech. This is an actual cloud. Praise God. It's not, it's not something that looks like a cloud. It, it's, it's an actual cloud. Next verse. So that the priest could not continue ministering because the cloud, for the glory, because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord did what? He filled the house. So we see, when for the glory to fill the house, every single person would have to become one and offer one sound. And offer one sound. It's not every time that the glory fills the house. But you see, the minute there is unity, in worship, and not necessarily just in the song, in singing of the song. There is unity of heart where every single person have come in recognition of the fact that they have come before a God that deserves to be worshipped from the revelation that we have based on Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 to the end. That unity eh, goes up to him as a sound. That's why you will see that in the New Testament, was when John was to be born, at the time that Zacharias, it was Zacharias' turn to be the priest, what happened was, if you go and check the Bible, Scripture says that they were in one accord. There was unity in what they were doing. And so, and Jacob visited. If you look at the book of Acts, chapter 1, when on the day of Pentecost, go and check it, it said that when they were in the upper room and they were in one accord, that suddenly there was a matter of, let me tell you, there's a, there's a sink that every one of us would reach in the realm of the spirit. And there's nobody that can deny that the presence is here. What we have very often in Christian gardens is that people have individual experiences. But you see, I come to tell you that there is a corporate experience and encounter with God that everybody in that room becomes a victim of that presence. But you cannot escape it. I don't have to tell you that the presence of the Lord is here. You know, you can see it visibly. We're talking about worship. What I just showed you is the act and the art of worship. The next time you ever worship God, now, I don't know what you do in your closet. That's between you and God. But everything I've just told you now largely talks about the corporate worship. The next time you come to church, please understand that there is he who we have gathered onto. And it's not the pastor. Do you understand? It's not the pastor. The time that you come to church is part of the worship. The things that you wear to church is part of your worship. The condition of your heart is part of your worship. Your participation in church is part of your worship. The songs that you sing is part of your worship. When every single person reaches that same point, when we become one, then we see the manifestation of His glory. If Truly, truly, 
this is our God, you serve him. And you have a revelation of who he is. Trust me, you cannot stand but worship him. You, you will not have a problem worshiping him. It's not about the song. You don't have to like the song. The song does not have to be sweet to you. You don't even have to know the lyrics of the song sometimes. Worship is beyond the song. And I pray that truly, as the Father is seeking those that worship him in spirit and in truth, that he will find you. 